good afternoon, good morning, or whenever you happen to be listening to this. Welcome to the Film Realist Podcast, the film and TV podcast from a complete nobody. That's hopefully for somebody. I am your host, Kal Naranya, here to record a podcast review in an attic in 30 Celsius temperatures where the AC is not working. So I'm going to try to get through this episode without melting. Not that that matters. You just want an entertaining episode. I'm hoping that that adds to it. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. This week's review will be of The Little Mermaid, the live action remake or The Little Mermaid 2023, which was released last week. There will, of course, be a non-spoiler review and a spoiler review of the film. So don't worry if you have not seen the film yet. Both of those time codes will be listed in the description. I'm not wasting any more time. Let's get into the non-spoiler review. All right, here in the non-spoilers for The Little Mermaid, I guess the only spoiler that I should say will be in this. No, you know what? If you've never seen The Little Mermaid, uh, any of them, the one from 1989 or the one from 2023, well, I hope you enjoy this portion of the review. This remake covers the entire plot, character arcs, for the most part, of the original film. One of, I would argue, the most beloved of the Disney Renaissance films. If you're unaware, I'm going to let you know that the Disney Renaissance, or Renaissance, if you're a big fan of How I Met Your Mother, thank you, Ted Mosby, is the run of films where Alan Menken and Howard Ashman started working on some of the animated feature films from the Walt Disney Corporation, starting with The Little Mermaid and arguably ending with Tarzan, which was the resurgence of the animated musical and really did save that division in from being shut down from Disney. There were the dark ages from the late 70s into the early or from the 70s into the early 80s. And with the Broadway style musical animated film saved this division of Disney and which was thankful because we got, I would argue, some of their best films of all time. The music, of course, for this was Howard Ashman and Alan Menken with some original an original song written by Lin-Manuel Miranda. I will get into that in the spoiler section of the review. Otherwise, I think the it's honestly it's going to be Spark Notes or Cole's Notes for this portion of the review. I think that Halle Bailey does a phenomenal job as Ariel. That is a character that is synonymous with Disney, specifically, obviously, this version of the character where Jodie Benson's portrayal of this of this young woman coming into her own, giving up something so fundamental to who she is as a character for a man. And I know there has been criticism of that element of the original and in the remake I'm not going to give my perspective on what a woman should do for a man. That is not what this podcast is remotely for. And quite frankly, it's not my opinion of what anybody should do. Agency is very important. I don't want to get any further into this. So I'm going to get back into the movie, which is that this character is very well known. That's what I was saying earlier. And doing something in live action is significantly different than animation, specifically with 2D animation, which was the style that the original film was done in. And Jodie Benson, who was the initial voice of the character and continued to do animated voice work for that character, even up until until Ralph Breaks the Internet most recently with all the Disney princesses characters, has a fundamental hurdle to climb. Obviously, the music element of this is something that Halle Bailey absolutely crushes. You can hear the music for it. Not an ad at all, but it's on Apple Music and Spotify. And that being one element that people have been critical of, of the Disney remakes, is that getting actors and actresses who are unable to sing, more specifically with Aladdin and Beauty and the Beast, some of those cast members just did not have the Broadway chops, Paige O'Hara being the original Belle, Jodie Benson, and some other Broadway talent being brought into those films. Or just the what's most interesting is that they did not use other actors to provide the singing voices. I don't know if this comes down to an ego thing. I personally am incapable of singing. If I got hired for a movie and they said, we're going to hire an actor to make it look like you have an incredible singing voice. I would take that in a heartbeat, but Halle Bailey does all of her singing and she absolutely crushes that. 
playing the quite literal fish out of water or mermaid out of water is very well done in this. The character is given a little more to do than there is in the original animated film. The relationship she has with Jonah Power King's Eric, I think is much more developed than it is in the animated film. One of the benefits of the length is you're able to establish why these characters fall in love while very quickly still uh, given the time length uh, or the time frame that the movie does take place in. For the most part, I would say that the performances are well done. They're faithful to the versions of the characters we are, again, familiar with. This film is 24, will be 24 years old in November, or the original, not this version, but I think that Javier Bardem as King Triton is very compelling in the scenes that he is in. Triton is a character who is not given a ton to do, but the emotional weight behind the character's decisions, I still think hold true in this live action version. I think that David Diggs is a fun Sebastian. Jacob Tremblay as Flounder is not given very much to do, which I find very interesting. Out of the two voice roles he's done, he's significantly better in Luca. While that's not a film I necessarily love, Flounder doesn't, outside of being the best friend who's kind of bashful with everything that's going on, I guess pun intended to a Disney dwarf, but that was not one of the seven dwarfs. That's not. Anyways, I'm very hot and let's continue temperature wise. <laughs> um, Aquafina Scuttle is obviously some people would point out that the gender of the character is now different, but Aquafina's ver not vernacular, but way of speaking, I think does quite suit who Scuttle is as a character. Somebody, and this is not meant to be a criticism of Aquafina, but in the way that she is able to portray a character who seems to know what they're talking about, but in essence does not really know, also sort of is in line with Sisu from her work in Raya and the Last Dragon, which is a Disney film that I thoroughly enjoyed. My biggest criticism of performance, and this is not down to the person at all, but the character of Ursula, played by my brain, by Pat Carroll in the animated film, was so special and such a phenomenal piece of voice acting in the Disney pantheon of animated films that, unfortunately, because that character was nailed out of the park the first time, there is very little dimension for Melissa McCarthy to add to the role without it feeling like an impression. And unfortunately, my point of view on the role is that it is almost an impression of the character. I think the makeup is well done. However much of it is makeup versus CGI, the character certainly looks like Ursula, and we get a little bit more character development, very minor tad bits of, or elements of character detail added to Ursula, but... The singing chops are not up to Pat Carroll and poor unfortunate soul does not hit it out of the park as being in what I would say is one of the best villain songs. There's a very funny, honest trailer joke about the, these boring bad guy songs or villain songs being skipped. But poor unfortunate soul, in my opinion, is one of the best villain written songs in all of Disney and for something similar to be prepared, not just with that one in Lion King being done as almost spoken poetry, that it's just it does not reach the heights of the original film in any regard for the sp The spectacle is there. And I guess moving into more specific, not plot details, I guess I will get into those later in the spoiler section, but the visuals are fine. I if you have seen Avatar The Way of Water, these are not those underwater visual effects, another Disney produced film that just probably needed more time and development in the underwater area. James Cameron seems to have a nail on it. These fall in line, I would say, with the 2018 Aquaman. And there are some fun visuals. The consistency of maintaining these characters in a live action format is fine, except for the fact that when you design them anatomically correct, the characters it's nearly impossible for them to emote and flounder is terrifying to look at. Sebastian is given a little more to do in that, in that his eyes are sometimes expressive. But other than that, I would hope that moving forward, if we are going to continue to do these live action remakes, and there are a bunch on the docket that have been announced or have been in development from Disney, that there's a happy medium there with live action detail, 
but a character that's actually allowed to be a three-dimensional emotional character and able to emote. When a character is an animal and unable to emote, the emotion feels completely stale. Lion King suffered from that, and I think to some degree we also get that with Flounder and some of the other animal characters in the film. As a whole, I took Melody to see that. Unfortunately, she was unable to join the podcast this time. I think the movie is good. It may be one of the better of the live action films because there are some additions that I think do enhance the film. Is it going to be able to reach the stakes of the original animated film? No, that's impossible because the first film or the original was so well done. But ultimately, some of the padding does feel like padding. The introduction of the new songs I don't think is as good as some of the original songs we've had in some of the other live action remakes. So if you're a fan of the the animated film, I think you'll enjoy this. If this is the first time you are seeing this, I think it's going to work. Some of the spectacle is there, but again, it's hampered by the fact that they want every animal in the water to behave in an anatomically correct and realistic fashion. So that's slightly disappointing and more similar to The Lion King, but there are some good performance in this, In this, I think, as I reiterated at the beginning. The chemistry between Hallie and Jonah is very well done, and I think the development that they did add that I will get into spoilers does work, and these versions of the characters I think will hold true for an entire new generation, which is part of the object of releasing this film to begin with. So that will do it for my non-spoiler review of The Little Mermaid. I'm going to be jumping into spoilers right now. All right, so spoilers are ahead for both versions of The Little Mermaid, the 1989 animated original classic and this new version in 2023. So some of the big additions are that King Triton is actually the brother of Ursula. Do they go into the fact that one is a merman and one is an octopus or squid lady? No, not at all. There are some minor changes. There's been some lists. We've had some Screen Rant writers on the podcast in the in the past. I'm not going to do an exact breakdown of big changes. Screen Rant has a list there for you. So I uh, you can <laughs> I'm not going to post it in the episode description, but it's not hard to find on Screen Rant, the site that I also go to for my movie news and otherwise trailer analysis. If I'm not doing one on my own, of course. And another thing that one of the main parts of the story that I did like, because I do think it helps enhance the difficulty that Ariel is going through when she is trying to, for lack of a better description, woo Eric. And I'm going to go explain the things that they did change or add that I liked in a completely unchronological order from the way that they're presented in the film is that outside of her also losing her voice, which they call her siren song. So it's, the power within them, which does fit in with the lore of mermaids being these sirens that called sailors to their depth, their death and the depths of the ocean that I like that element of why these things are so special, the voices of the mermaids, but her memory is lost because it is an interesting nail to throw into this issue. She has where she is incapable of, trying to achieve that goal if she is incapable of remembering it. It adds more zaniness to Flounder, Sebastian, and Scuttle trying to help her with that, and adding an added level of difficulty I think does add to the fun of those couple days that she is with Eric. But one of the big changes that I did appreciate was Eric in this film is a orphan. He has been adopted by the queen of wherever he lives. I don't actually remember the place he's supposed to be from. I know Ariel is from Atlantica, but I don't know where exactly. It's, I'm guessing somewhere in the Caribbean based on a lot of different things around the island he is from. But Grimsby is the prime minister, and I feel like he was just the, way, the, the s- butler who was doting on Eric the whole time. So Eric is this person who feels like he's from nowhere, which does connect to Ariel in a way where she's always wanted to explore the land beyond, or just man's world, or human's world, sorry, for, um, not man's world, there are obviously women and non-binary people in the world, but she wants to explore the land of humans, and that is a similarity between the two of them, they want to explore the unexplored, as well as Eric has his own cavern of different things he's collected through his time sailing throughout the seas, 
And in doing so, we do get to see these characters actually spend time together while not one is talking and one is listening. But the level of bond feels sincerely more earnest in that these two characters are of similar interests and their interests are piqued by the unknown and they have a shared curiosity of the unexplained, not in terms of paranormal or supernatural, but what is beyond the worlds that they have grown up in. And I think that that element certainly adds to the connection and why these two characters fall for each other, specifically with Eric, who is somebody who's been obsessed with the idea of this woman who sang to him when he is saved, similarly to the, the original film, but why he forgets to focus on that, and it is a focus until Ariel shows up, is because the connection between them does feel, I wouldn't say more earned, but it is given more time to be developed. So when you are seeing something like this in live action in a longer film, it does feel more realistic given the fact that one is a live action fairy tale and one is an animated fairy tale. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but give Rob Marshall, the director of this, who also made the Mary Poppins Returns film, which I quite enjoyed, understands how these things need to function in a different medium. And that element I really did like. We do get very minor additions about where Ariel's mother is and that she was in fact killed by humans of the land, which does explain why Triton hates humanity and that added element of his fear for what could be out there for the mer people holds and it is an element that is added ariel's mother was eventually added in canon to the third film ariel's beginning which is actually a prequel to the original film and outside of that eric is given a song and scuttle is given a rap written by Lin-Manuel Miranda, which is quite fun explaining what Scuttle was experiencing the day that Ursula shows up as Vanessa. But outside of that, unfortunately, I think that the song written for Jonah Hauer King as Eric is a lesser version than Evermore, which was a song that was written for the Beauty and the Beast film that I thoroughly enjoyed, but ultimately I think it fails to reach the heights of that wild uncharted waters. And it's, it's that Disney style of song of wanting to go into the beyond and exploring the unknown because he does not want to be stuck to the Island where his mother wants him to be safe. And I don't know necessarily if the sound mixing was the issue in my theater. I have not had a chance yet to re-listen to it, but as somebody who did enjoy some of the newer songs, speechless evermore, specifically speechless, which was the, in the Aladdin remake, I think that this song does not reach the heights of the newer ones. I do think the scuttlebutt was fun, but it falls in the same category to me as Morning Report, which was an, a song that was written for the Broadway musical, or if not written for the animated film that was never included, included in the Broadway musical, and then included in the special edition of the animated Lion King original film. I may have my history mixed up in that, but again, I apologize. It's about 30 degrees in my attic right now. Anyways, so outside of that, I think the spectacle does work to some degree. It's interesting that the finale does not change at all. Ariel, no, I shouldn't say that. It has changed slightly in that Ariel is the one responsible for directing the ship that eventually impales Ursula. But outside of that, there are not a ton of massive changes Ariel does still become a human and they are sent off to explore. And we get to see that one of the elements that is more prevalent in this film is the, the existence of mermaids is questioned and possible amongst the humans. But that relationship seems to be mended by the union of Eric and Ariel adding to why they are all, why both species are around each other for not their wedding, but their send off. We don't actually get to see the wedding, which is an interesting change. But outside of that, I, I'm not down on the film. I'm not hot on the film. Well, I mean, I'm hot physically right now because my temperature is high. I'm sorry if I talked about how warm the attic is, but outside of all of those things, I think I painted an effective picture of what, how I feel about the movie, what my issues were with it. I think if you wanted to be very critical of is this paint by numbers, the original? Yes, you could say so. But given the fact that I think the cast members in this are doing the best they can, and some, I, I would say already, do succeed in their portrayal of these roles, that it does work. There are certainly worse films in the live action remakes of 
Disney's cartoons and this film I would put maybe in the middle closer to the top I'm not sure I've seen the other ones more than once which have allowed me an opportunity to judge them more critically or less so let me know if you've seen this film for yourself you can tweet at me at Kyle underscore Naranya or at Film Realist. Don't forget, Realist has two E's, but that will do it for my spoiler review of The Little Mermaid. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Film Realist podcast. I'm remembering to do this again, which is that the theme song for the show was written by the band You Vs. Me. You can check out their music on Apple Music and Spotify. I would highly recommend checking out the Signal Ray song, Raise the Dead. That's one of the tracks that I've thoroughly enjoyed, and I actually listened to it on my car ride home today. Next week's episode will be a review of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse with potentially a special guest, so you'll have to be following me on the socials to see who that was. That episode will be posted later than normal because of scheduling issues. I wanted to get the guest on the episode, so I'm very much looking forward to that. Please, if you love the show, like, share, Give it a five-star review on your podcast platform. It helps this little show of mine raise its rank in the film and TV podcast. That will do it for this week's episode. I hope to see you next time. Have a good one.